Don fucking Hancock. I should now change my middle name. <laughs> OK, kids. Um, to thank you, Kim, and to everybody who puts this whole event on. I know it is not easy, as I do a lot of events myself, and so I want to make sure that everybody realizes how appreciated I feel for all the work that you guys do to make this possible. Um, today's going to be interesting. It's about risk. I'm taking one myself, so let's get started. Today, we're going to talk about the Kent effect. These days, I feel like the luckiest motherfucker in the world. In October, I get to marry the kindest, most beautiful woman that I've ever met. And with her, I gain an amazing family who's welcomed me with warm hearts, open arms, and genuinely a willingness to try anything once even my family's customary jello shots. <laughs> and you know, my day job doesn't suck either. I'm fortunate to have created a company that almost 20 years in still fills me <laughs> with passion and energy. And it's not just because we get to work with so many great organizations and causes. I mean, it's these guys, the ones that will take one for the team when we need it, the ones who go out of their way to give a thousand percent without ever being asked and it's why I try very, very, very hard to make sure that they know how appreciated they are. Simple things, um, like an annual uh, fun day that we do in Humboldt Park called the Cross Park Challenge. Um, or much, much bigger things, like very, very secret surprise trips to faraway lands. Uh, I mean, I firmly believe all of this that I've had the ability to do over the last 20 years has never been possible without the Kent Effect. And most people know of the Kent Effect as uh, something called the butterfly effect. The idea of the butterfly effect is that a butterfly in Brazil could flap its wings, and that may indirectly send a tornado through a small town in Texas just by causing really tiny changes in the atmosphere that ripple across the globe. So in my scenario, the Kent effect is in reference to an old roommate of mine who from college really, his seemingly very small act of kindness 20 years ago um, sent me on a path I never knew would have been possible and really I've tried really hard to make certain that kindness uh, he gave me has been multiplied uh, tenfold. So two of the most valuable things we have are time and relationships. And in our age of increasing distractions, it's more important than ever to maintain perspective and remember that life is brief and tender. If you don't know Candy Chang, look her up. She's, uh, she's awesome. So I spent the first nine years of my childhood without a care in the world, living life like it was never going to end. <laughs> I mean, they didn't call me the red tornado for nothing. I mean, that's what childhood's supposed to be. And then in January 1984, right after my 10th birthday, my mom was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. Today, there's less than a 10% chance of survival. Back then, there was less than 4%. But nobody told me any of that. So I went on with the same carefree attitude that I had the past nine years. And then on August 16th, my mom passed away. And my life was forever changed in ways that I'm still uncovering. And so for many years, I really resented the fact that no one gave me the full picture. I felt like if I knew what was coming, that maybe I would have made different choices, um, spent more time with her, cleaned my room once in a while, or I mean, at the very least, would have been there to hold her hand when they took her off life support. But damn, that's some fucking heavy shit for a fourth grader. So 30 years later, I'm finally starting to really realize 
maybe that my dad and aunts and uncles uh, made the right decision by not telling me. I mean, I know for certain I was the apple of her eye. I mean, being her only child and all. So I can imagine that those short eight months that we had together from diagnosis on were really the times that she cherished the most. She was able to watch me run around, play, play, live life, and that must have brought her a lot of joy. I mean, even knowing that our time was probably coming to an end. And while I don't have any life-threatening ailments, thank God, I do totally get how good it feels to be able to give something so precious as time to people that I love. Because that's really what my family did for me. They gave me time to be me and my mom time to cherish it. So everyone has a chapter they don't read out loud. Well, here goes. My teenage years were full of a lot of angst and depression. My entire room was painted black. I slept in the closet, both literally and figuratively. And while I had a very close group of friends that I considered family, uh, that didn't deter my multiple attempts at suicide. It didn't help that my father had a debilitating disease that combined with his own depression uh, from losing his wife of 14 years, left us both really spending a lot of time thinking about what we didn't have. And unfortunately, we never talked to, to each other. I mean, we didn't talk about anything, really. So I was a teenager in a lot of pain, but thankfully, I found photography. Finding that was a way to express my emotions through the lens of a camera. Uh, I think it actually saved my life. It certainly gave me an outlet that I was desperate for and a way to really dig deep without ever really understanding it. Ph photography led me to design, which of course led me to type and color, and thankfully to a school uh, was the best in town at the time and I had no idea. Honestly, I really just decided to go there because all my friends were. But college opened my eyes, as it does to most who are paying attention. It's where I became a vegan, where I realized I was gay, and where I started to understand the power of faith in myself. And to me, swap the word faith for risk, it's the same idea. I think it's really the idea that, you know, no matter what it is, you'll be given something to solve to stand on or learn something and be taught how to fly. So after a few intro to design courses, I started questioning whether or not I was in the right spot. I was missing the emotion that photography had. I mean, it was fun to draw letters and make compositions using the photocopier, but I didn't really feel the same way as I did about photography. So thanks to Susan Lally, one of my typography professors, I was encouraged to stick it out. I'm still not sure what she saw in my crappy black and white typographic exercises, but I'm thankful that I didn't throw in the towel. However, not every single professor believed in me. I had one in particular, John Ashman, <laughs> who told me I would never find a job. Certainly not with the way that I approach projects. He thought that my bleeding heart and determination to do work that I felt made a positive impact in the world would be a detriment to my career. And I don't know if it was my stubborn Capricorn tendencies or what, but his negative attitude only fueled me more. So I ended up working three jobs while I was in school. Um, I really kind of had no choice. I couldn't afford it any other way. One of them was a monitor for the Viscom computer lab, which was a pretty happening place back then. Uh, there were probably only 12 computers for 80 students. And even though I worked there, I rarely had time to myself to use them. The hours were somewhat limited, and with my full schedule of classes, my other two jobs, I had a very hard time finding time to get my own work done. So it was time to buy a computer. But shit, computers were very expensive back then. <laughs> and I needed at least $5,000, which was almost as much as an entire semester's tuition. That's how long ago that was. So I naturally reached out to my dad. He certainly had given me everything when I was a little girl. However, now he was living in a retirement community in Arizona, <laughs> just getting by on Social Security and his limited pension. So he didn't have any money for me. So I asked my aunt for a loan. I knew she likely had money given her multiple houses around the country, but she said no and told me that my dad should be the one to help. So now what? I was feeling pretty discouraged. 
And I genuinely questioned if I would be able to finish the semester with the workload that I had and the limited time that I actually had to do it. And that was the start of the Kent Effect. And I think life is really not about a big break. It's about one significant, small, life-transforming step at a time. And sometimes you don't even realize that you're taking those steps. So Kent came into my life through an ad in the local newspaper. I was looking for a roommate, and he was recently divorced and looking for an inexpensive, stable place to allow him to focus on his nursing degree and also be a great home for his two kids to hang out a couple weekends a month. I was super hesitant at first because, I mean, the guy was almost 20 years older than I was, and he had two kids under 10 who he wanted to stay at our place. But he really had such a positive attitude, and I loved his determination to go back to school after having been in the military for 20 years. So I figured, why not? And it was about midway through our first semester living together that I realized having my own computer was going to be the only way that I could go to school, go to work, and get my stuff done. It would allow me to do the schoolwork after I'd get home late at night, and after the computer lab was certainly closed. So Kent heard my cry for help, and while he didn't have any money, since he was barely getting by himself, he offered me something that was even more valuable, something that I didn't know, I don't think I even realized uh, was an option. He told me that he believed in me and that he would be willing to risk his own financial future by co-signing on a credit card for me. And then we were in business. Just like that. <laughs> well, I wasn't actually in business yet, despite what this photo might look like. But I he had that ability to give me that two millimeters that I needed to send me in that direction that I think really is why I am in the place I'm at today. I was finally able to manage all of the work that I had, which allowed me to finish school on time. Yay. And um, of course, I didn't have any debt at that time because I was working all those jobs. The only thing I had was that computer that I had to pay off. And of course, I was very consciously paying that off. I would never have put Ken's credit in jeopardy but now it was time to find a job. Something that I was certainly not sure that I could even do, to be completely honest, because I had that wonderful professor who told me I was never gonna find a job. But, as Steve Jobs said in uh, his, the commencement speech that he gave, you cannot, you cannot connect the dots moving forward and only looking back. And so sometimes you just have to trust yourself. And for me, this was, this was that faith for me that I could figure out what I needed. So as it turned out, I happened to graduate at the exact right time. There were probably five opportunities for every single designer, and with the experience that I had gotten at all the different jobs that I was working, um, I was able to find a job pretty quickly. And I probably could have had any job I wanted, to be totally honest with you, but at the time I you know, had no idea. So I was living in fear that nobody was gonna hire me, and I did what most people do and took the very first job that was offered to me. It was a small studio. There were four people. We had our hands on pretty much everything. My boss sent me to learn HTML so they could start offering their clients websites, which in 1996, you can see, was pretty ahead of the pack given these actual real sites from that day. Unfortunately, my time there came to an abrupt end when they found out I had been researching jobs in Minneapolis where my cousin and uh, best friend were living. It was a hard lesson to learn, but looking back, it was exactly what I needed to experience to keep me moving forward on my path. So, moving on, and of course living with plenty of fear, given I had been fired from my very first professional job. I mean, who knew if I was gonna get another one? What if they call the only employer I ever had? They certainly weren't giving me a recommendation. So again, went for the very first job that was offered to me. And this time, it was for a place that I could have never seen myself working. A 500 person software consulting firm who worked for corporate America. And I would be the sole trained designer on a team of six. But hey, they offered me more money than I had asked for, a wonderful benefits package, pinball, 
foosball, PlayStation, and a whole bunch of other really cool amenities. When I toured all of the big design studios when I was in school, they didn't have any cool shit like this, that's for sure. So I said, let's do this. And I did for about two and a half years. Uh, I had a lot of fun there, there's no question. But the work, you know, wasn't exactly the most inspiring. I'm sure a lot of people would have been really excited to design Motorola or Allstate's websites, but it just didn't really do it for me. So I, since I had a computer at home, I decided to offer my help for free to a bunch of my friends who were working for nonprofits. Um, they didn't have any resources to hire a professional, and it fed my soul while giving me an opportunity to really do something fun, and frankly, anything was better than what they could do at Microsoft Publisher. So. And then two very, very, very major life dots happened for me. The first was a volunteer opportunity that I received to concept and brand an entire campaign to get women to quit smoking, which I aptly called Bitch to Quit. <laughs> it was, and it still remains, the most responsibility that I have ever felt from a project. I mean, I could save someone's life if they came through the doors, signed up, and quit smoking. I better fucking get it right. So while working on that campaign, um, and completely out of nowhere, my dad died. And I wasn't even 25 years old. And just like that, in the blink of an eye, I became an orphan. Again, swap out the word grace, but I saw this yesterday and felt really um, compelled to put it in because I feel really strongly that when you're standing in front of something and you, you don't know what it's going to look like, uh, just that reminder of, you know what? I've done this before. I've been here. I can make it happen again. So within three months of my dad's passing, I quit my job to start my company. I just realized that my life was far too short to not do what I loved and to waste it on things that were, I wasn't passionate about. So now that you've heard my story, you know that I've only had a few years of professional experience at this point, and none of it was actually client-facing. Thankfully, I'd paid off the computer by now, but with my dad's passing, I found out that I had an $8,000 student loan that he had taken out, and I suddenly had to pay that back. And let's not forget that all of those clients that I had, i.e. my friends, never paid me a cent for any of the work that I was doing. So what business did I have starting a company? Uh, none, basically. <laughs> but the one thing I did have, the only thing, frankly, uh, was the confidence to finally know, no matter what, what was the worst thing that could possibly happen to me. I'd have to go get another job. Big deal. And with the ease that I maybe had the last couple times, I guess I probably wasn't worried about it for, for a change. So I took the risk. And almost 20 years ago, and while the company has certainly had its twists and turns, we've never wavered on our values or mission to positively impact the world. So fuck you, John Ashman. <laughs> <laughs> you probably know who he is, right? Uh, so I'm really proud of the work that we do, the opportunities we give to create things like our 10-day summer camp, um, or opportunities to help individuals who are struggling to get out of poverty through our program Reason to Give, um, or even the services that we offer for free every year through our Grant for Good program. You know, it's, I'm proud of it, and I know my parents would be too, but I'd never be able to do this by myself. It's, it's these guys, row two here, basically. Um, they're the ones who make all the difference. They're the ones who make all this stuff possible. And that's why I reward them with opportunities and time to spend with their loved ones. And it's why I bring them on a trip every year uh, to come with me, because they're my family after all. So you never know what butterflies around the world are doing today that may affect you tomorrow, or when Kent may show up at your doorstep. And in the end, all we truly have is time. Some of us just have a lot less than others. So don't be afraid, follow your heart, take that risk, and try never to take time for granted. Thank you.
Thanks, Ken. I didn't cry. So good. <laughs> I thought I was going to cry, and I didn't cry. So.